Good morning. Let's open our service this morning. We're going to stand and sing number 20 in the blue book if you need it. Alleluia. We had to put the screen up because we're going to have a baptism here in just a minute. So you can turn to number 20 in the blue chorus book. Good morning. Oh, let's try that again. Good morning. We welcome you to our service this morning here at uh, Beulah Baptist Church. We're so glad that all of you could be here on this March, uh, spring, winter, summer, whatever it is. Uh, it's good for you to be here. We, we love having you here. And so we hope that you're blessed as a result of the service today. There's little blue cards in the pew racks. If you're a newcomer, please uh, fill out one of those and put it in the offering plate when it comes by a little bit later in the service. But we've got a baptismal service here right off the bat uh, after we pray, and then we have other things lined up as well. So we hope that you are blessed, that you are drawn closer to Christ, uh, that you are able to dig deeper into his word as a result of being here today. So let's commit this time to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us. Father, we thank you for the warmth of this building. We thank you for the warmth of the fellowship. And Father, we pray that every aspect of this service this morning would bring glory and honor to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, he is the reason we're here. Because we, many of us, have been saved by his blood. We've been born again. And now we are his disciples, following after him and learning the things that he would have us to embrace. So we pray this morning, Father, that in the singing, in the fellowship, the proclamation of your word, that all of these things would just point us away from ourselves and point us away from this fallen world in which we live, and that we would focus upon Christ and then have a renewed purpose and a renewed outlook for ministry as, as we go out into the world. Father, bless us now, guide us in all that we do, and we'll give you the glory and the honor for everything that's accomplished here. For it's in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior that we ask it. Amen. We are blessed this morning to have Solomon Etsy to come and to be baptized and to express his obedience uh, to God. Uh, one of the very first acts of obedience for someone who has professed faith in Christ, for someone who has been born again, is to be baptized. Uh, that is something we find throughout Scripture, uh, that when persons were, were committed to Christ, when they were born again, one of the very first things that they did was identify with Christ in baptism. It's an outward act of obedience, and it strengthens their faith and affirms them as well. So for this morning, before we get into the baptismal service itself, let's hear from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, beginning with verse 13. It says there, speaking of Jesus, Then children were brought to him, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, 
Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and then went away. And so we are thrilled to have young Solomon Etzel come this morning. Uh, as I said, in obedience to Christ's command to be baptized. Solomon, you want to come down and join us? And we have a chair here for Solomon to stand on because you wouldn't be able to see him if, if he wasn't. But now he's there and you can see Solomon. Uh, Solomon is, uh, has professed Christ as his Savior. I've talked with Solomon. His parents have talked with him. He has a very thorough understanding of the gospel. As a matter of fact, if I had been unsaved, I would have been tempted to pray and ask Christ to forgive me of my sins uh, after we talked together. So, but we are very proud of, of not just Solomon, but what God is doing in his life. And it should be something that inspires the rest of us to share with our children and our grandchildren the gospel of Christ so that God can do his work in their lives and bring them out of the darkness of their sin, even at a young age, and bring them into the light. So we're so thrilled to have Solomon to come this morning. Let's pray for Solomon. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Solomon Etsy. We pray, Father, that through this baptism this morning that he would just be strengthened in his faith. Father, we know that every time that we obey the commands that we have been given by Christ, that it does strengthen us and it sets an example for others. Father, we thank you for his parents and for his grandparents and the rest of his family who have encouraged him to be at this place today. And Father, we just pray that you would just use this time to remind him of his commitment to Jesus and that others of us would be inspired as he has followed after you at a very young age. Father, just bless him, bless his household. May he continue to grow and be a light to all of those who are around him. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Solomon would also, after baptism or upon his baptism, like to become a member of Beulah Baptist Church. So for all of you who rejoice with that decision, would you indicate it with an amen? Amen. Okay, Solomon, let's step down off the chair. <coughs> In obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, Solomon Etsy, into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Bear with us a second. <laughs> Isn't technology wonderful? <laughs> Till you want it to be quick. good. Let's go move on with our service. We're going to stand and sing in Christ alone. And we needed the word, so here we go. <laughs> Amen. 
Amen. You may be seated. Morning. All right. Let's see here. Uh, this is our last Sunday for our American for Christ offering. Now, I know we're a little bit behind. We haven't had Susan Likens to give her passionate speeches, and I'm just not as uh, articulate at that. We got to find somebody new to, you know. I mean, Susan's uh, had some big, big shoes to fill, but you know. So today's it. So if you can get into, you know, we'll see if we can uh, meet our goal there. So uh, keep on going. All right, and then tonight, AB Men will be meeting at 6 p.m. over in the Richard McDonald Ministry Center. So uh, be aware of that and come on out for that. And they're looking for a few people to fry some bacon on Sunday, April 21st. And if you can help out with that, see, that's for our uh, sunrise service. So if you can help with that, see Frankie or Pam there. And then, okay, here's this one. I messed this one up pretty bad in the early service. Um, a Mon Mondi Monday Thursday service will be on Thursday, April 18th. It says 7 a.m. It means 7 p.m. though. If you want to come out at 7 a.m., hey, I'm sure Pastor will be happy to come with you too. <laughs> See, he's back there in the back. But anyway, 7 p.m., there's going to be a special uh, music, a short message, and Lord's Supper that, that evening on that. So come on out for that. And then if you look at your insert there, let's see here. We've got all of the April activities listed there and our, our Easter services and everything going on there. And then also the Camp Callan schedule is listed there. Now, we've got those forms on the back table. And uh, don't forget that uh, the church is going to take care of uh, the fees for uh, all our members. And uh, any of the kids that go, they can take a friend with them. Uh, and we'll, we'll also pay for that friend to go. So be ready with that. Oh, and also on the back table, guess what? April is here already. Be nice with your jokes tomorrow on all your friends on April Fool's Day. Remember, that's a National Atheist Day. You know, the... One, that verse in the Psalms that says, you know, only the fool says there is no God. So National Atheist Day tomorrow, so be ready for that. All right. Let's see here. Uh, that and that. I had a whole slew of pictures. Let me, where's my picture guide? All right, here we go. My notes on the, on the pictures that we had here. Of course, you're not going to work now. Come on. Here we go. Okay. Wait a minute. No, not that one. All right, here we go. All right, this first one, Jacinda again. She's moved on from soccer to track, and she's got, doing this four by 100 team. Now, it's almost a Beulah team because they got Jacinda, uh, Jaden Blackhurst, and Josie Grass on there. So the four of them are doing really well with that, so be sure to encourage them with that. And uh, Becky Lake is the, I think the girl's coach there, so uh, it's an all Beulah thing going on there. So we'll be sure to tell them good job and wish them well. And then Matt Hawley, he, you know, remember we had the one thing where he was doing all the stuff uh, where he got promoted to the sergeant. Well, he also made the, the papers there again with uh, all the, the work he's doing with the, the canine units there. So uh, good job, Matt. And, uh, you know, I like seeing the kids, kids there with them where they're showing them doing that. So good job, Matt. And then another one here we've got um, this is uh, out at the Flemington Community Team Basketball League. So they had. Uh, uh, John and Drew Hardesty there with the 13 to 15 year olds. It was almost like a Beulah little competition here again. They got the first place there with that one. And then Corey and Doug Robinson, they got first place with the 16 through 18 year olds. Now I guess instead of the trophy at the end, they got a Bible at the end. So, uh, so that, was, that was real nice to hear. They had a, uh, John would always talk about the, uh, you know, with, what was going on there with that when, in our Sunday school class. So, Really thrilled to hear all the good work they're doing doing there. And then this last picture, oh, phooey. Here we go. Jada was having all types of fun with Carly visiting. Now, <laughs> now when she posted this one on, on Facebook, they were talking about, notice the ornery looks on both the kids' faces as their parents are both asleep there. So... <laughs> And I did comment on there and say, you know, hey, that's going to be the one we're going to show. And uh, Jada, you know, gave me a thumbs up on that. So she is excited for this to be up. And uh, but Carly made it back safe. Uh, and we're thrilled. We're looking forward to hearing hearing about that trip. And just make sure to keep Jada in your prayers as as uh, they're continuing on here with uh, uh, her mission trip. So. 
flying to De DePaul but today? Oh no. Okay. Okay. So they're kind of divvied up there. So definitely keep them in your prayers. And uh, it's what a wonderful opportunity this has been for them. So really looking forward to uh, just continuing Jada's trip and hearing when she gets back. So August, right? When she gets back. Okay. All right, so birthdays. We've got uh, Janice DeVault, Jaden Blackhurst, Linda Bell, and Leah Devert. And then anniversaries, we've got Jeff and Becky Kittle and Terry and Kay Mayfield. So happy birthday, happy anniversary, everybody on there. And our scripture reading comes out of the book of Acts. And Megan's going to come up and read that to us. Good morning. Uh, today we'll be reading out of Acts 17, 1 through 12. When Paul and his companions passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thess Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah has suffered and rose from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Uh, he said, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, and so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace and formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed into Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and the other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the other, others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the, mes the message with great eagerness and s examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result of many, they, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Thank you, Megan. And if our ushers will come, we'll take up our morning offering. Jason Griffith, if you could pray for the offering, please.
Christmas time, we have a special from the choir. Amen. Thank you, choir. <coughs> have a question for you real quick before we go to our hymn. How many of you sitting in here are men? I know it can be confusing in society today, but raise your hands if you're a man. Now, if you're not raising your hand, I'm concerned about a lot of you. Anyways, the men are going to meet tonight. If you've never come out for a men's meeting, we would love to have you come out. We have fellowship and food, and we study the Bible. And... The good thing about the men's meeting, this is going to get me in trouble, but I'm going to say it. When you come out to the men's meeting, you're allowed to have your own opinion because your wife's not there. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I was at a funeral yesterday, and my uncle sat down beside my dad, and his wife told him, um, we're going to sit down here. He said, he said see, I, I forgot to ask before I sat. So, see? <laughs> but in all seriousness, you can look around and see, we normally have about 12 men come to our meetings. Now there's four or five times that in here, folks, and we would love to have you come out and join us for the men's meeting tonight. From six to usually around eight, and sometimes we go long, but you're allowed to leave anytime you want to. So come and join us. Let's take our hymnals now and turn to 485. Revive us again, and we'll go ahead and let the kids go downstairs for junior church. 485. Stand as we sing. We praise the old God for the sun. Joy 
he plays the next verse, we'll let the choir go down, and you get around and greet one another this morning. And the last verse. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Amen. You may be seated. And real quick, since uh, we have several visitors here today, I thought I better rectify the fact that our women know that I pick on our women, but I'll be the first to say that the church could not function without the women, and we love them very, very much. That was a nice attempt to get out of the doghouse. I don't think that worked. Because <laughs> once you're in, you're in, buddy, and I just don't think there's anything, but... We'll see what happens. I was sitting down there and Jonathan said that and I thought, oh no, it's just, he's just, I'm not worried about the church, worried about Jonathan and all the, the problems he may have. So, but, uh, but regardless, we come to our prayer time now uh, and I got a lot of uh, requests uh, uh, that are in the bulletin as always. Uh, and so be sure to look over those. We try to keep those updated, uh, but sometimes we, we don't do that well. Uh, and so if you see a name on there that needs to be taken off, especially if you ask for somebody to be pl placed on the prayer list and they've already recovered, that sort of thing, let me know. 
uh, and I'll do my best to get that information to Pam Slayton or let Jonathan know, uh, and we'll get that to her. We'll try to keep that as current uh, as uh, possible. So we've got all those requests uh, that need our prayers, uh, and then we just want to pray for one another. Uh, there's nothing like the interaction and the fellowship of God's people to strengthen our spirits as, as followers of Christ. But there's been a lot of trials in our congregation. It goes beyond sickness. Uh, there's sickness, there's bereavement, and there's other trials as well. So let's just pray for one another. And if you pick up on something that somebody's going through something or they're having a difficult time, uh, reach out to them, uh, say something to them, certainly lift them up to God uh, in prayer. That's, that's what we do here. That's one of our main functions as a body of Christ is to encourage one another and to love on one another. And we just draw strength from that. Uh, so make sure that you pray for those who are going through various kinds of trials, and I'm not going to start listening or anything like that. So, but let's just, just pray uh, for those folks. Many of you know different situations in the congregation where people are facing various kinds of obstacles or challenges. Um, let's also pray for the Young Life event today at 3. Uh, Carly uh, Harris is the chairman of that uh, uh, group, the Taylor County Young Life Committee. Uh, I'm serving on that as well. Uh, so, but we're really wanting to do all we can to get Young Life established here in, in this area, in Taylor County. It's been present for a while. We just want to make sure that we have a strong committee and we have a very strong presence. And so, uh, but anyway, today at 3 o'clock, there's a special event. You've probably already heard about it. Um, so, but anyway, just keep that in mind and pray for that committee even after this event. Uh, we want to do all we can to reach young people for Christ. Uh, and also middle, mid-high uh, uh, youth uh, for Christ with the wildlife uh, ministry. So just pray for that. Uh, and then also, let's just pray for the lost, lost children, uh, lost teenagers, uh, lost adults. We have a world around us that needs to know Christ. Uh, and that's right at the front of our marching orders as, as Christians, as, as followers of our king, uh, is to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And our world starts right around us. And so let's pray for our lost family members, lost friends. If you're newer to the congregation, I've, I've encouraged everybody to make a list of at least three or four people, maybe in your family, maybe co-workers, maybe classmates, uh, but to pray for three or four people who are lost, pray for them by name, pray for them regularly, and do, never think that someone is beyond the reach of God and that they're too hard of a case. Uh, God has never seen too hard of a case. Uh, and so as, as, as maybe resistant uh, as that person may be, or as pagan as that person may be, you don't know what the power of God can do. Uh, and so he can do anything. So we want to pray for them that they would come to a knowledge of Christ. Uh, and certainly it begins with prayer. And then that God would use us to share uh, the gospel with them as we have opportunity to do so. So we've got all these requests we want to take to the Lord in prayer. We're going to have a few moments of private meditation. If you'd like to slip forward to the front of the sanctuary, feel free to do that. If you want to pray where you're seated, that's fine as well. But let's have a few moments of private prayer, and then we'll be led in praying together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you for the words to that old hymn that are the song and the prayer of our heart for all of those of us who know Christ as Savior. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing 
from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. And Father, as we gather here this morning, that's, that's our attitude. That's, that's our prayer. That's our motto. Glory to his name for all that he's done for us of bringing us out of the darkness and the, and the depth of sin and giving us new life and setting us on a higher plane and, and on a course to heaven when we leave this world. Father, we did not deserve it. We did not do anything to merit it. But Father, you have chosen to save us for your grace and in your mercy. And Father, this morning our hearts are full. Even though circumstances may surround us and problems may plague us, and it seems like the things are pressing in from every side, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, and he has chosen to show mercy to us when there was no obligation to do so. Father, may we always look back to the cross. When we are suffering, when we are going through trials and hardship, may we remember him who suffered for us and the pain that he experienced and the opposition that was his and the death that he died and the great love that you have shown to us through that death on the cross. And Father, we thank you he didn't stay in the grave, but on the third day he was raised from the dead and now lives forever and gives us new life as we look to him and rest in him for our salvation. Father, we pray this morning that you administer to all those on our prayer list. Father, we have so many that are ill and that are dealing with bereavement or other situations. You know their, their, their lives, you know their, their hearts and, and their, their, their life stories, and so minister to them as only you can do. And use us here at Beulah as a part of a loving, encouraging family that helps them to follow after Jesus. Father, we pray this morning that you would minister to the Young Life uh, program that, that's becoming even more established here in Taylor County. We thank you for the efforts of those who are seeking to reach youth where they are and to reach them on a, on a neutral ground and then to bring them to Christ and to plug them into churches. Father, we pray that you would guide those who are part of that and work through them. And we've seen the young people who have served in that and the way that that your spirit has touched their lives and moved through them to bless others. Father, we pray that you would minister to, uh, to just the lost in our lives. Those three or four folks that we're praying for by name, we ask that you would convict them. May you just impress the truth of the gospel on their hearts and minds. Draw them out of their sin. and Give them a new life in Christ. Father, we pray that you'd use us as a part of that process, and may we always be willing to share. May we always be willing and ready to give an answer for what we believe. Father, we pray that you'd forgive us of our sins for the times when we get caught up and distracted by other things and, and, and wrapped up in the temporal things of this life rather than the things of the life to come. Father, may we understand that our citizenship is not in this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. And our hearts and minds are to be rooted there as we interact with people around us. Father, guide us now as we open up your word. May it speak to our hearts. May it enlighten our, our minds. May it, may it just empower our wills. Father, we pray for our leaders that you would guide them. We pray for local leaders and national and, and international leaders. Father, guide them in the way that you'd have them to go. Father, bless us here now this morning as we seek to honor you and dig into your word and apply it to our hearts. For it's in Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 17 is the passage for this morning, if you haven't already turned there. And I tell you, it's just hard to find good deacons nowadays. Um, I've, Bob Withers was back there, and he was helping with the baptism, and, and so after everything was finished, and little Matthew, uh, or uh, little uh, Solomon got out. Matthew was there to, to get him, and, and so Matthew was, or Solomon was all wet, and, and he didn't know exactly what to do. Matthew just said, well, I'll, I'll carry you. And so his dad carried him back into the room, and I looked to Bob, and I was all wet too. I said, Bob, would you carry me? And he just <laughs> looked at me. I had to walk myself all the way back to the changing room when somebody else got carried, so, but uh, anyway. 
Uh, that's, that's the way it goes. Um, as, as many of you know, um, last year Jeannie and I were doing our best to make a move from South Fairmont to, to Grafton. Um, we loved the people of Beulah, we just wanted to be closer. And after months of one struggle after another, after another, after another, to sell our house and to purchase a house in Taylor County, we finally became convinced that it just wasn't God's time for it to happen. And so one of the huge benefits now as a result of us still living where we were living, uh, of spending more time driving is my ability to listen to Christian audiobooks and podcasts. I just devour those things. I don't listen much to the news, and I've shared with you folks my frustration with the news. I'll watch the news a little bit, and then I get turned off, or I get upset, and I get in a grumpy mood, and I don't want to be grumpy, and so I just turn from that, and I turn back to Scripture. So I really don't listen to a lot of music. I listen to it occasionally, Christian music, but I really enjoy learning and growing spiritually by listening to theologians and preachers and teachers. So my little Subaru Forester has become another place to study and to learn about the scriptures as they pertain to life in 2019. Each one of us who has been saved is now a disciple of Jesus Christ. And a disciple means more than just wearing a name. It means more than just calling yourself Christian. A disciple is not just one who is eager to follow his master, but one who is eager to learn from his master. And as you go back to the biblical sense of that, you see disciples would follow after a master and they would learn from him and they would watch him and they would observe him. They would listen to his teachings. They would be transformed by those. And so that's our place as well, as much as we are able, is to learn and to grow and to dig into God's word and to make progress in our faith. Following Jesus and learning from God's Word, they, go, they really go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. They've got to be combined. And if you're just kind of coasting along in your Christian life and you don't have much of a desire to get in God's Word and you don't have much of a, of a desire to learn more about Christ, well then you need to ask yourself the question, how is my relationship with Christ anyway? Is it truly healthy? And chances are it may not be if there's not that desire and that hunger there to grow and to learn more of what God would have you to learn. And perhaps if that desire isn't there, then to study God's word anyway. And then after you get started in that, you'll, as the scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so you'll get into that and, and then it will begin feeding you and strengthening you. So, but anyway, in this morning's passage, there's an excellent example of people who did both. They learned from God's Word, and they followed Jesus. They did both at the same time. You and I can learn from these Bereans and the example that they set. And so there's three examples that, that we have here. There's three lessons to, to grasp in this passage. And there's so much to say that I can't cover it all in one message. So I'm going to do the first point today, the first lesson from, from the Bereans today, and then we'll cover the next two next Sunday. So first of all, Learn from the Bereans. Don't resent the gospel. Learn from the Bereans. Don't resent the gospel. Listen to verses 1 through 9 again. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Jews, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decree of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Now, a lot of folks like to quote Acts 17.11 about the Bereans, and I love quoting that as well. They, they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul and Silas were saying was true. It's a wonderful verse. 
But in order to really understand that verse fully and to have it applied to your life today, you need to go back to the beginning of the chapter and find out what was actually happening with the Thessalonians. So Paul is on his second missionary journey. He's departed from Philippi and he's passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia. It's about 100 miles from Philippi to, to Thessalonica. So he follows his custom of going first to the synagogue and preaching the gospel. For three Sabbaths, he reasoned, he explained, and he proved from the scriptures that Jesus had to suffer and to die and to be raised from the dead and that this Jesus is the Christ. What Paul is sharing here is the biblical gospel. He's going back to the Old Testament, God's written revelation at the time, and speaking the gospel. He's sharing from the scriptures. He reasoned with them, it says. He made his case from scripture. He explained to them. He opened up what the scripture has to say about Jesus. And he proved to them. His presentation was powerful. It was convincing. And then verse 3 says that it was necessary. Jesus, Paul said, had to die. It was God's plan. Now, one of the uh, oldest expressions of the gospel that is found in the New Testament is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 4. Paul puts this into the letter as he's sharing with them. It's a little bit older even than the letter itself. Paul says there, For I delivered to you as of as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So the gospel always goes back to the scriptures. Now, one of the very dangerous things that we see happening today, and a lot of folks are just now beginning to identify this, is what's called progressive Christianity. It's really not Christianity at all, but it's this idea that because we're living in the 21st century, because we're living in modern times, we need to take Christianity as we find it in the Bible and progress it and change it and transform it in order to be more palatable and more receptive to the culture around us and the people who we, that are living in society today. So it's, it's a very dangerous thing because it departs from Scripture and it goes in other directions. We see mainline denominations struggling with that. We see other people struggling with that, taking out the, the offensive parts or the troubling parts of the gospel and then perhaps inserting something else. The gospel is that man is dead in his sins. This is the biblical gospel. And, and I'm going to go through some verses here, and I think Jay's got them up there on the screen. They're in smaller print. Um, Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. The gospel is that man is dead in his sins. Without Christ, you are dead in your sins. You don't just need a makeover. You need a resurrection. You need new life. You just don't need a little bit better life. You need new life. You're dead in sin. The gospel is also that the heart of man is wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? People are not basically good. I hear that again and again, and people throw that around. You know, folks are pretty much good at heart and that sort of thing. That's not what the Scripture says, and that's not part of the Gospel. The Gospel is not that you're good at heart. The Gospel is that you are wicked at heart, and Christ saves you and gives you a new heart. That's the Gospel. The Gospel is also that God is angry over man's rebellion. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God, which is God's anger, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now the idea is, is that God is always loving and God is always kind and God is love, but God also has wrath and he also has anger and that's why we're so thankful for the blood of Christ being shed for our sins because it turns away that wrath and we experience God's blessing and his mercy as a result. The gospel is that because of God's love, Jesus died as a propitiation for your sin. Now, that's a big theological word. Propitiation for your sin to appease the wrath of God. It's in 1 John 4.10. It says there, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us 
and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. In other words, he takes care of sin. His blood is shed so that the wrath of an angry God is turned away because of what his son did on the cross. The gospel is that Jesus was raised from the dead so that you might have a new heart and a new life. Romans 6, 4 says, We will bury therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And the gospel is that Jesus, or Jesus is God's only way of salvation from God's wrath and reconciliation with God. Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, well, which we must be saved. So unless you know Christ, unless you have asked him to forgive you of your sins, unless you have been regenerated by the power of his Holy Spirit through the blood shed on the cross, you will not experience eternal life with God. There is no other way. Now that's the gospel that Paul was sharing with the Thessalonians. And although a few of them believed, most of them resented it. It made them mad. And so as a result, they just shut down on Paul, and they basically say, we don't want to hear any more of this. And they bring a riot together, and they run him out of town on a rail. Him and Silas both. It was a message they hadn't previously heard from the Scriptures. It made them feel uncomfortable. And they saw it as opposing the conventional wisdom of Roman society, and they wanted none of it. Caesar was the only Lord, and, and this Jesus as Lord business contradicted the, the political correctness of the day. So the Jews of Thessalonica didn't just reject the message, they resented the message. They're jealous, they're angry, and they seek to make these proclaimers of this strange new message pay dearly. They incite a mob, they start a riot, and they say all kinds of slanderous things that twist the gospel. Jason was probably, Jason is mentioned here, Jason was probably a convert who had been hosting them in his house, but by the time the mob reached them, apparently word had already reached Paul and Silas that the mob was coming, so they were gone, so they dragged Jason before the authorities, and they throw all kinds of accusations against him of being an enemy of society and an enemy of Caesar. And finally, the authorities calmed things down and they let him go. And the money that was taken from Jason was probably something similar to bond. Uh, money that would be lost if Paul and Silas ever showed their faces again and they ever stirred up trouble again as they had already done. So the first lesson is here, don't respond to the gospel the way these Thessalonians did. Now their response is not unusual, their response is common. That's the way that sinful man and a sinful heart and a sinful mind responds to the gospel today. That's why the Bereans were of more noble character, because they were a cut above. They were unusual. But the Thessalonians, were it was a usual response. So when you hear that you're dead in your sins, that's not a pleasant thing to hear. You don't want to hear that. You think, well, I'm very much alive. Thank you. I, I don't want to really hear that. It doesn't stroke your ego at all. When you hear that your heart is wicked, that runs contrary to your self-pride. Well, you know, I, I think I'm a pretty good person. I do a lot of things. I help out my family. I'm a good provider. I try to be a good father, a good grandfather, whatever it may be. When you hear that God is angry and he's wrathful over your rebellion, that's not likely the kind of God that you had in mind because he's more of a very gentle type of person, kind of laid back, whatever you want to do that's just okay. Don't really worry about it. Sin's not that big of a deal. But that's not the biblical understanding of God. And when you hear that God in love and mercy offered his son to die to appease his own wrath and anger towards you, that likely seems kind of barbaric. And that's, that's kind of ancient and it really doesn't apply to us anymore because we're more sophisticated than that. But that's the biblical gospel. And when you hear that Jesus has been raised from the dead and that it's only through his death and resurrection, that you can have a new heart and life and fellowship with God, it's offensive to all the other religious schemes that you may have in mind to obtain God's favor. And it's certainly not respecting of those who follow other religions to say that you're wrong and Christ is right, but that's what the gospel says. The truth, however, is that it is all from the scripture. Paul made his case from scripture. The genuine gospel, when you hear it today, is based in Scripture. 
And so as I mentioned earlier, there are many false gospels that pick and choose Bible verses and oftentimes just omit Bible verses if they, if they even use any Bible verses at all. But the biblical gospel is offensive when it's first heard. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 23 through 24, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now it's important to understand that the religion of these Thessalonians was a very comfortable, convenient thing. They, they were very much in, in a rut uh, here in Thessalonica. They'd been meeting in the synagogue perhaps for a long time. They'd been going Sabbath day after Sabbath day, and uh, they'd not heard the gospel. But they were just hearing from Scripture, that sort of thing. They were hearing other things. They had a comfortable, convenient relationship with Rome and with all society. And, and they were going to church. They were doing their own thing. They were being careful to acknowledge Caesar as the only Lord. They were certainly fitting in with all the conventional wisdom and everything society would tell them to do. Caesar was the true king for them, and there was no one above him. Then Paul and Silas show up, and they're in the synagogue, and they begin saying things and preaching a message that makes them feel uncomfortable. The message of Christ as Lord contradicted the conventional wisdom that Caesar was Lord, and you could pretty much do whatever you wanted to do as long as you acknowledge Caesar was Lord. Here, Paul and Silas are saying Christ is Lord of all. When Paul and Silas were preaching and, 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 and what they were promoting, it was not convenient. It was not comforting. And it certainly was not politically correct. But that's the nature of the biblical gospel. Paul and Silas were, were raining on their parade of, political, or of, of, of uh, piety, so to speak. But rather than going back to the scriptures, these Thessalonians, rather than going back to see if what they were saying might actually be true, they became angry, they started a riot, and they wanted nothing else to do with Paul and Silas. Now, sadly, what was true of the Thessalonians then is true of many people in churches and in society today. They've never really heard the biblical gospel. Or if they've heard the biblical gospel, they resent it, and they want nothing else to do with it. They've heard of God's love, they've heard of God's blessings, They've heard of God's heaven, but those things alone are not the gospel. So when many people hear of the depth and the extent and the awfulness of sin and the wickedness of every man's heart and the holiness of God and God's wrath towards sin, they immediately shut down. I don't want to hear anything like that. I want something more positive. And when folks hear of God's son Jesus being offered as a bloody sacrifice to turn away God's wrath, that there's nothing you can do to save yourself, that it's only through hearing and believing the gospel that you can be saved from hell, they turn away. But that's the very nature of the biblical gospel, that you've been dead in your sin, that you're under the wrath of, 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 of a God because of your sin, and that the only way that you can be saved is through his mercy and through the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross for your sin. That is good news. But it's the gospel. It's the biblical gospel. So the point is, when you hear, or when your friends hear, strange things today that most megachurch pastors don't say, or that most mainline churches don't proclaim, or that most Christian authors don't promote, don't just shut down and, and tune out. That's what the Thessalonians did, and they were not commended for it. That's the temptation. Instead, go back to the Scripture and see whether or not those things that are being proclaimed as a biblical gospel are actually there. And then if you find them there, then your choice is whether you're going to believe God's Word or whether you're going to believe the, the creations of a man's mind. The gospel is good news, but you can't comprehend good news if you first don't understand the horrible, awful reality that exists in your own life. It's through the scripture that God reveals the reality of sin and salvation, so go back to them and search them. The truth that you will find here will not be comforting at first. It's convicting, but conviction is a good thing. 
It tells you that something is not right between you and God. Something is not as it should be. The Holy Spirit is working with you. And the way that you deal with conviction is to repent of sin and turn to God. It will not be convenient. It certainly will not be in line with conventional wisdom and political correctness. It contradicts those. Jesus says in John 8, 31 through 32, if you abide in my word, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And listen to this. And you will know the truth, not just what a lot of people are saying or not what a lot of people are promoting. You will know the truth from the scriptures and the truth will set you free. Paul and Silas were preaching the truth here in Thessalonica. They were preaching the gospel. And so the first lesson to learn from the Bereans is not to resent it. The Bereans didn't resent it, but the Thessalonians did. Paul says in Romans 1.16 of this same gospel message, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. One Bible teacher summarized what the gospel means for you and me. In this way and just about every time I read these words or I speak them I have I'm just very moved by them once I was free in the shackles of sin free to be tempted but bound to give in free to be captive to any desire free to eternally burn in hell's fire till someone bought me and called me his slave Bound by commands, I am free to obey. Captive by beauty, I am free to adore. Sentenced to sit at his feet evermore. That's the gospel. Amen. Bringing you out of sin and bringing you into right relationship with God. That's what Christ has accomplished on the cross for you. So don't turn from the truth of the gospel this morning. When you read it in scripture, when you hear it proclaimed, turn to Christ and what he has done for you by his death on the cross and his resurrection on the third day according to the scriptures. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of the gospel. And Father, may we never be ashamed of it. May we never seek to to back away from it and 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 heaven help us if we seek to modify it or change it or alter it so that folks around us will be a little bit more pleased with it or find it more palatable in, in their own lives father may we be true to your word and may we may we present it and proclaim it with all of its glory and with all of its power and father we thank you for the salvation that we have in christ many of us here have been born again we thank you for that, that truth that Christ died for our sins, and he's still continuing to transform us as we follow after him, as we study his word, as we spend time together in prayer, as we gather together with other believers. We're growing, we're maturing in our faith. So, Father, may we always have a desire to progress and learn more and grow more. May we never be content with the place in life where we are. And, Father, for those of us here who don't know Christ, if we've never been forgiven of our sins, may we turn from our sin. May we embrace the conviction of the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I am a sinner. I do believe that Christ died for me on the cross, and he is the only way that I can be right with you. Father, may that be our prayer this morning. And then as this invitation hymn is sung, may those of us who need to make a first-time decision, may we come forward. May others of us who need to rededicate, may we come as well if we've been shutting down on the gospel when it's been presented to us. And Father, for those of us here who may need to come into the membership of Euro, Father, guide us in that way as well. Just, just, just encourage us and motivate us and compel us to be obedient to you. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the glorious gift of the gospel that's been entrusted to each one of us. May we be faithful to share it with all of those around us. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is number 249. Just as I am, we'll sing the first and the last verses. Let's stand as we sing.
Chuck McDonald, would you close us in prayer, please? <laughs> 